Hi, this is Jonas from VHDLWest.com. In this video, you will learn how to create a timer module in VHDL. In the last tutorial, we learned to create a clocked process by using the rising edge function. When we created a test case for our flip-flop module, we used the wait statement in our test bench. This way, we could delay any changes to the input signal by 20 nanoseconds or whatever value we wanted to. This is fine for test benches, but wait statements only work in the simulator. It's impossible to translate into real hardware, and therefore it cannot be used in production modules. So how do we measure real-time in VHDL? Well, let me show you right now by creating a real-time clock module. To get us started, I'll copy the test bench from the previous tutorial and save it as a new file which I will call t18 for tutorial number 18 underscore timer tb.vhd. Change the entity names as well. We're going to keep the clock and reset signals, but the other signals we're going to delete. Then I'll delete the instantiation of the flip-flop model from the last tutorial because we're going to create an entirely new module. Finally, I'll delete everything from inside of the test bench sequence process except for the final wait statement. We'll get back to the test bench file later, right now we're going to head over to the flip-flop model from the last tutorial. I'll copy the code to a new file which I'll name t18 underscore timer .vht. After I'll change the entity names, I'll head over to the entity and delete the input and output signal from the port declaration. Then we'll get rid of the flip-flop comment because this isn't going to be a flip-flop anymore. Finally, I'll remove the assignment to the output signal which we already deleted. This is going to be our starting point for this tutorial. We're now left with a skeleton of a clocked process. This is how I start when creating most of my VHDL processes. In fact, I do it so often that I've bound one of the F keys to inserting this code snippet when I press the button. Alright, let's start creating this module by declaring the output signals. Except for the clock and reset, this module will have only outputs. This is going to be a clock module, so the first output will be named seconds. And it's going to be of type integer. Next one, minutes, also of type integer. The last one, hours, with the same type as the others. The way this module is going to work is that it will output the correct hours, minutes and seconds in real time. So that we could hook it up to a display and it will actually show the time since it was started. Ok, so this process wakes up when the clock signal changes, and all the code is wrapped in this if rising edge function, meaning that it fires only on the rising edge of the clock. If the reset signal is 0, then this module is in reset. The negative reset is active when it's 0, otherwise the module is not in reset. In here, we're gonna reset all the outputs, and after the else keyword, we're gonna put our main logic. The program will reach this point when there's a rising edge on the clock, and the reset signal is inactive. The first thing we got to do on our quest to measure real time in VHDL is to declare a signal for counting clock periods. I'll name the new signal ticks, and it's gonna be of type integer. We're gonna use this signal for counting clock ticks or clock periods. Down in our process, we'll increment this signal by one every time there is a rising edge of the clock. Then I'll create an if statement above, which will fire if the number of ticks equal the clock frequency. The clock frequency is always known. It's measured in hertz, which just means oscillations per second. Therefore, when the number of counted clock ticks equal the frequency, we know that one second has passed. But where are we going to get this number from? We're going to get it as a generic input to this module. We'll have to assign a value to this constant when we want to use this module. We'll do that later in the test bench. Using a generic for this is better than hard coding the number inside of the module because then we can use it in different designs running at different clock frequencies, and it will still work. Actually, we have to count to clock frequency minus 1, otherwise we would be counting 1 too many clock periods. The closed interval from 0 to x includes x plus 1 integers, and we only want to count x, therefore minus 1. Ok, at the 1 second mark, what do we want to do then? First of all, we need to reset the tick signal so it starts counting from 0 again. And then, inside of an else clause, I'll put a line which increments the tick signal. This code is going to be evaluated on every rising edge of the clock, and if we've counted 1 second worth of clock periods, this expression is going to be true, and the tick signal will be reset. In all other cases, the else branch will be chosen, and the tick signals will be incremented. Now, if this is true once every second, we can use the inside of here for counting seconds. We'll simply increment the seconds output signal by 1. If the second signal reaches the value 59, we're gonna have to do something. We've got to reset it back to 0, and the incrementing of the second signal goes into the else clause. Ok, so this if statement here is true once every minute. What do you think we need to do inside of here? 
Yes, we need to increment the minutes signal. If the minutes signal is 59, we need to reset it, and the minutes incrementing line goes into the else clause. This if statement is true once every hour, so instead of here, we will increment the hour signal. If the hour signal is 23, we don't want it to go to 24, we want it to wrap back to zero. And of course, the incrementing line goes into the else clause. This if statement is true once a day, but we didn't declare any days signal, so we we'll leave it there. And there it is. These nested if else statements are actually all that's needed to implement a real time clock in VHDL. The internal tick signal will count the clock periods, and from that we derive the seconds, minutes, and hours. But there's one thing we forgot to do, and that's to assign a reset value to all signals. When using clocked logic, you should always assign reset values to all the signals that are controlled by the module. So inside of the if n reset equals zero, we'll set the ticks to zero, minutes to zero, and hours to zero. All right, let's save this and head over to the test bench. Now we need to instantiate the timer model which we just created, and we'll do that right here at the start of the architecture. I'll name this instance i underscore timer. The library is work, which is the default library in VHL. The model name is t18 underscore timer, and the architecture name is rtl, which goes into the parentheses. Then we need to do a generic map. We have to give a value to the clock frequency generic input, which we created earlier on. We already have a clock frequency constant in our test bench, which we'll use for that. Next up is the port map. We've got to map all of these signals in our module's port to local signals in the test bench. We already have the clock and reset signals, but we need to create some new signals to assign the seconds, minutes, and hours outputs to. Then we'll map them to the timer module's entity port outputs with the same name. And that should be all that's needed to create an instance of the timer module in the test bench. Time to simulate. I'll save the file and add the two new files to our Molsim project. First, I'll compile the timer module, and there's a problem. Molsim complains that it can't read the output seconds. If we go back to our port declaration in our timer module, we see that the output signals are declared using the out keyword. But down here, we're using its value to compare with the number 59. We're reading it, and we're not allowed to read outputs in VHDL. We're only allowed to drive them. One way to fix this is to change the out keyword to in out. Now it goes both ways, and we're allowed to read them. I'll compile the timer module once again, and then the test bench. After we start the simulation, we can see the signals appearing in the objects window. But these are the signals belonging to the test bench. We could use them, but then we wouldn't see the tick signal, which only exists in the timer module. If I select the i underscore timer instance from the window to the left, the tick signal will appear as well. I'll add them all to the waveform and press the run button. By default, they are ordered alphabetically, so I'll quickly rearrange them. Initially, before the first rising edge of the clock, all the integer signals have this rather strange value. The value shown in the waveform is in hexadecimals, but translated to integers is minus 21474836488, which is the smallest value a 32-bit integer can hold. Signals get the leftmost value by default if you don't specify otherwise, and this is the leftmost value of the integer type. The reset signal is zero, which means that the module is in reset, but it doesn't become effective before the first rising edge of the clock. Remember, this is how clocked logic works. Everything happens at the clock edge. After that, all the signals get their default value of zero, and then nothing more happens, because the reset signal never changes. Not very exciting, so let's head over to the test bench and see if we can do something about that. Down in our test bench process, I'll add a wait until rising edge of clock line. Make it two of them. We need to allow one clock signal for the reset signal to become effective. Then we're going to take the device under test out of reset. We do that by assigning one to the reset signal. After that, the test bench sequence will pause forever on the single wait statement at the end of the process. Alright, let's save this, recompile the test bench, and restart the simulation. What we got here is the module coming out of reset after the second clock cycle. Then all the other rising clock edges are counted by our ticks counter. But we only see the start of the action. I can press the run button a couple of more times, but each time I press it, the simulation goes for another 100 nanoseconds. But we want it to run for a lot longer than that. I can go to the console and type run 10 seconds. But that's forever in digital logic, and it will take forever to simulate. Instead, we'll just click the stop button and head back to our test bench file. Right here at the top where the clock frequency is defined, it's set to 100 MHz. If we change this to, for example, 10 Hz, it will be a lot less work for the simulator, and it will go a lot faster. We're slowing down the clock to speed up simulation time, 
and this won't affect the quality of this simulation. Once again, recompile the test bench and restart the simulation. When we now type run 10 seconds, it completes in an instant. When we zoom out, we can see that the clock signal is running at 10 Hz, and the second signal is changing less frequently. The seconds are counting exactly where the tick signal wraps around from 9 to 0 again. Of course, that's because the clock frequency is 10 Hz. The wrapping point is handled by our clock frequency generic. Let's run for a little more, say 10 minutes, and zoom out. Now, the second signal has been counting a lot more, but this value is displayed in hex by default. Let's select all the output signals and right click, select the radix, unsigned. Now, the value is displayed in normal decimal notation. Let's focus on the wrapping point of the second signal, exactly where it goes from 59 and back to 0 again. The minutes signal increments. But we only simulated 10 minutes, let's go a bit further. How about we run for another hour? Here we can see that when the minute signal wraps from 59 and back to 0 again, the hour signal increments. What will happen if we run for 24 hours? Then we can see that the hour signal wraps from 23 and back to 0 again at the end of the simulation. After that, everything will repeat itself over and over again. That's all the coding we're gonna do today. By now you should know that measuring real time in digital logic is done by counting clock cycles. If you know how much time one clock cycle takes, it's basically just a matter of counting them. If the video was a bit too fast, or if you just want to copy the code, you can check the video description for a link to the blog post for this video. Thank you for watching, and check out vhjlwist.com for more tutorials and blog posts.